Well, laser pointer, yeah. That is fantastic. Oh, here we are. Wow, popular astronomers. Good evening. It's not often you see a view like this. Let me get my um, AirPods connected. Uh, uh, apparently they are. So, uh, right, okay. Where am I? I've gone. I've gone away. Um, tick -a -tick -a -tick -a, solo layout. Right. This is Pop Astro Live Nova Edition. We have got a Nova episode appearing somewhere in the midst of Cassiopeia. And this is Robin Schedule of the SPA. Hi, Hi Robin. Where are you? <laughs> right. I'm in my back garden near High Wycombe. And I've got yeah. a camera on the sky with a 200 millimeter telephoto lens. So it's giving you like a binocular view of part of Cassiopeia. Now, if I move the camera over to one side, those two stars, the bright stars there, are the two right hand stars of the W of Cassiopeia. And the other stars are up there, you see. Now, if I move this way, now, that there is a, a finder chart on the SBA website, so if people want to know more, they can have a look there. Now, let me find my laser pointer, try and get that working. Uh, there we go. Right. Now, that is a star called 4 Cassiopeia, that one there. And just below it, you can see this little quadrilateral of stars there. Right. The one down in the bottom right hand corner is this nova it wasn't there a couple of nights ago now i don't know this from personal experience but a japanese astronomer amateur astronomer found it a couple of nights ago can you imagine finding that star but these guys the japanese are very red hot on finding these objects and what's more he beat the professionals to it so he found that that little star which i just pointed out and i don't know if i can get there's, uh, there we go. That little star there. Well, I can't hold the laser pointer steady enough. The bottom star of that little quadrilateral, anyway, is the Nova, and it's close to another one. Um, now, uh, <coughs> I think it's that one. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. <laughs> but it's the right part of the sky, anyway. And there's a little blur there, which is the cluster M52. So there you are. We managed to bring it to you live. And <laughs> Robin, so, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Okay. What's, so first of all, good evening, popular astronomers. This is Pop Astro Live, insane um, excitement, Nova edition. Uh, we'll talk about who we've got as guests in a minute. But first of all, I really need to know what's the difference between a Nova and a super duper Nova. Right. The Nova is, probably, is a fairly ordinary sort of thing. They've been happening for... They happen all the time uh, in our galaxy. There are about 50 a year, but we only see a handful of them because there's so okay. much dust and gas in the way. A supernova is an absolutely massive explosion. There hasn't been one seen in our galaxy since 1604. We've been oh, seeing wow. it in other galaxies. If one appeared fairly close to us, it would be as bright as the full moon. And okay. that's how it would be an absolutely fantastic sight. But as you can see, the Nova we've got tonight is a fairly run-of-the-mill Nova. The brightest Nova I have seen was about uh, in, back in 1975. That was called Nova Cygni. And it was like an extra star in the cross of Cygnus. And it was about a second magnitude, uh, about one and a half magnitude. So that's about as bright as they get. But a supernova, if that happened, that would be an absolutely amazing sight. And, you, you know, it would, it would be the brightest object in the sky if we were lucky enough to see it. That is great, Robin. OK, so I'll let you go back inside now. And well, what colour is it? Is it just white or does it just look it, like it a normal is. star? Uh, it, it's a normal star looking star. Yeah. Um, I'll just have a, another look at the uh, the field of view. Yeah. Um, and as I say, it is. Um, I get the laser point on it again. I'm looking at a very small part of the sky. So. Is just that little star there. So it's in between those two, that one and that one. Uh, so anyway, I might have it wrong. I'll check it with the star map <laughs> when I go in. But you're looking at the right part of the sky. So if people want to look, there's a star chart on the SBA website and uh, you can find it with binoculars. That's great news. Thank you very much. Head to the Pop Astro website. Robin, how long do we think it's going to be around for? Um, 
probably a week or so. It might get a bit brighter, I doubt it. It probably will fade from now on. So it's clear night tonight if you're where I am down in the south of England. So have a look if you can over the next few lights. This is really exciting. Thank you so much, Robin. Speak to you soon. Okay, bye. Bye. Just when I thought the most exciting astronomy show in the world couldn't get any more exciting. We've got a live Nova. Thank you so much to Robin Schedule there for pointing that out to us. So the comments are already running away. There are that blimmin' many. So good evening. This is Pop Astro Live. It's your weekly gamma ray burst of astronomy excitement. Join in with the fun. Share the video. Um, tonight's guests are Liam Kennedy, inventor of the ISS Above. Now, this is really exciting. This The whole thing was exciting before we had a Nova. Uh, the ISS above is a Raspberry Pi that presents live info and vids from the ISS straight to your TV. And I've had a look at it and it's really, really cool. And we are gearing up for some really impressive passes of the ISS in the next couple of days. I've not seen it for months, so that's exciting. Then it's Eleni with Space News, Space Weather, Space Traffic and Travel. Then our next guest is Andy Lawrence, Regius Professor at Edinburgh at the Royal Observatory. I had to Google what Regius meant. It meant means basically Basically, I've got to curtsy when he comes on and kowtow. Um, Andy uh, will be talking about his book, Losing the Sky, a subject dear to my own heart. I thought I could see the zodiacal light here in beautiful dark sky Anglesey. And it turns out it's the new truck stop for HMRC Customs with the lorries that have to go over. And the immense floodlights have got to be at maximum height and maximum brightness to provide safety to the truckers. So I'm really unimpressed with that. It's like a burning light on the horizon that I thought was a zodiacal light. But anyway, yeah, light pollution. <clears throat> um, Andy has rock and roll stories about Brian May, the zodiacal light. I need to see it. But that is all overshadowed by like a daytime supernova by the fact that Andy used to go to school with our very own Paul Sutherland, and he's got pictures of him wearing flares. Very trendy, actually, Paul. Sonia will be here, last of all, with the observing co forecast. And Cosmos here, he's not been anywhere this week um, too far because I need to finish at nine prompt tonight. So there we go. So without further ado, um, I'm going to go over to Liam Kennedy, who, who appears to have disappeared from the green room. No, he's there. Are you coming, Liam? Three, two, one. There he uh, is. I was gonna, I was gonna do it this uh, way, you know. There you go. <laughs> just to, he's just materializing. For extra flair. <laughs> okay, so nice Liam. To be here. Now let's get it over and done with. You've got an odd accent. Why is that? <laughs> yes, I have an odd accent, uh, especially for anyone who's uh, in the UK, which most everyone is here, right? You probably think, hey, he sounds a little bit like he might be from England. Uh, and yes, I am. I was originally born uh, in a little town south of Cambridge uh, called Haverhill. And uh, in 1994, I decided to, it would be a good idea if I persuaded my wife that it would be a good idea for us to move to the USA. So now I come from, uh, I actually live very near to uh, at Los Angeles in Southern California. And in fact, what was going on right behind me here, in fact, if I just zoom back a little bit, that actually is a capture of uh, the, the Bay Area from the International Space Station uh, live cameras that uh, my ISS above gizmo um, features. So what you're seeing right there in the middle of the screen is the Bay Area. And uh, just in a matter of like a minute and a half, maybe even less, uh, you see Southern California come into, come into view. So, and people who know what they're looking at can see a whole bunch of stuff here. Like there is the San Andreas uh, Fault that is visible right there, right now. Anyhow, that's uh, that was a target of opportunity because my I've just got a pre-recorded video going on right now, and I'll bring up some live video from the space station soon. 
So you, uh, we met during an online networking last week and the minute I clocked you, I was like, I've got to get in touch with this chat because I know that you're going to make our audience really enthusiastic and excited. So tell us about what ISS Above is, please. Sure, yeah. So, and I'll, I'll do that by giving you a little demo uh, of the ISS Above. Uh, before I sort of get into that, I will show you what it is. So this was the original ISS Above that I developed uh, some uh, seven years ago in 2013 because I wanted to be the coolest grandpa and I wanted my uh, grandkids to know every single time that only people in space were passing them by. Um, and uh, I did a Kickstarter for that. Um, but just to give you an idea of what it does, how it lets you know that the space station is passing by is it does this. Um, every time the space station is, a, is above your horizon, it has a very bright LED that lights up like this. Um, just to make the connection to the UK, the little device that's in here that's doing that flashing is from a company in Sheffield called hey. Pi Maroni. Uh, it's called the Pi Glow. <laughs> so um, that's, that's essentially what I created. Um, you know, my background is in outreach, astronomy outreach. I used to be the president of Orange County Astronomers here in Southern California. And in public outreach is by far one of the most um, exciting things that I discovered the public were interested in was whenever the space station was passing by. So I created it really from that perspective. And just to give you um, a sort of a, a further detailed insight into what the ISS above does. So um, many folks may have heard of the Raspberry Pi. Um, it is just a little computer system, but I programmed it to track the space station. And this one is actually set to your neck of the woods, Vicky, over in Anglesey. So the red dot is right over where you are. And if I just bring that back. So we've got some really good passes of the ISS coming up, haven't we? You absolutely do. So, and, and here's the thing that I want to stress to everyone. The space station passes everyone by at least five to eight times every single day. Does it's it? It's just, just that at particular times in the month, there are times when it's visible. And um, what I'm going to show you is, uh, this is again coming from uh, the the ISS above, this is showing you a calendar of all of the passes of the space station over Anglesey, but it really relates very much to most of the UK. And um, so it's got uh, the days down on the left, as you can see, it, it's, uh, it's about 12 days of passes. And then it's showing you uh, across the top the hour of the, of the day that each pass is happening. And can you see all of those, cl the cluster of green and yellow circles? Right. What that is showing you is next week, and I hope the weather is good, <laughs> there are so many visible passes. In fact, on several nights, there are two visible passes of the space station. And I want to let you know, the UK is super special for visible passes. Um, more so than for other latitudes. It's really related to the latitude that you're, that you're at. Um, in Southern California, I'm about 30, 31 degrees latitude, but obviously in the UK, you're 50, 52 and above. And that means you're at the very peak of the space station's northernmost portion of its orbit. And what that means is it just equates to way better visible passes. So, Even better than what you get there. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I can show you what my visible passes are. I've got another device here set up to right. So I'm going to get myself out of the way, and I'm I'm going to you're going to blink compare the different. Uh, so that's oh, yeah. that's that's me. That's you. Ah, we me, win. Sucks to be me. Uh, awesome to be you. <laughs> this is the only time the only time I've ever been grateful for the UK's latitude to be honest we do have yeah, its plus points yeah that's one of the funny things about when I moved to California um, although I was you know partial you know, I was um, a, a little bit interested in the night skies in the UK I was just so surprised when I moved to California 
it was like, wow, uh, there's no clouds for six months. <laughs> that <laughs> must be lovely. I, that's when I got into astronomy. <laughs> so um, um, James Dawson mm. is asking, why are some nighttime passes not visible on the plot for passes over Angle C? You tell me. Yeah, really, really good question. They're the, ones, fact, they're uh, the ones when I'm in bed. Yeah, yeah. No, and that is exactly right. So, so let me just zoom myself out the way again. Can you see? Yeah. So the passes, the visible passes. Oh one thing you can notice about them is that they are all clustered for the couple of hours after sunset. So, and it's all to do with the only reason you can see the space station is because it is reflecting sunlight. So, although for you the sun has set. Um, the space station at 260 miles above is still uh, visible to the sun. So you're seeing a reflection of the sun. So, but just picture what's happening to the sun as the night progresses. The sun is, is getting further and further um, a, you know, around the other side of the Earth. And what happens, you can see here about 9 p.m., uh, just after 9 p.m., there are no visible passes. That means at that time, the space station, when it passes you by, it's completely in the um, the Earth's shadow. So long long story short, that's that's what it's about. But really good observation. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have noticed that, to be honest. <laughs> you, could, you could also see that uh, this is taking into account that daylight savings is coming on. Uh, British oh, yes. summertime, right, is starting next weekend. So, Yay! Uh, um, um, so you're anyhow. the unit now. This is in thousands of schools and NASA centers now. The um, ISS mm -hmm. above. That's yeah, amazing. I, you must be so I thrilled. Am very, I am very, very lucky that uh, that that's the case. It's uh, it's now in over three and a half thousand locations worldwide. That's um, so good. The biggest group are actually in uh, that's not in the U.S. is in the U.K. So there are a lot of uh, Kickstarter supporters that I ship to. Um, you can also buy one of these ISS Above units ready-made, fully set up for you, and it comes from the issabove.eu website. And uh, that's run by someone who works for the, uh, the DLR, German uh, Space Agency. Um, there are f quite a few in schools in the UK as well. One of them up in Leeds, uh, Full Neck School. <laughs> yes, now you could imagine how this would mm. capture the attention of school children. Yeah, and in fact, that really is what I spend my time doing these days is um, really, and what's happened is it's really provided a way for, for, for teachers to have their students naturally get interested in it. You'll find that students really under, get to understand how the space station is moving, what it's doing. Um, I show who's up there so people get to see who the crew is. And then whenever there's something interesting happening on the live feeds, there are, there are multiple live feeds from the space station. Like today, um, three of the astronauts, two cosmonauts, one US astronaut, uh, got into the so one of the Soyuz spacecraft, undocked it, went around the neighborhood and docked to another port. So those sorts of things I feature on all ISS Aboves. I sort of have control over your ISS Above and send them out to you. <laughs> now Anyhow. then, you said that mm. the might you might see something proceeding is proceeding in front oh. in front of the yeah. ISS. Yeah, that's What's right. it going to so, be? I'm so glad you, you reminded me of that. So yeah, um, actually a few weeks ago, uh, the astronauts ejected. Um, it was actually the Canada Arm did it. There's a there's a giant battery pallet of old batteries. You know what do we do when we you know. Um, our batteries need to be thrown out. We, we I take them to the post office. Precisely. Well, in this <laughs> and case, recycle them. What they've done is just simply push this, give it a little bit of a push, and now this giant battery pallet is now in front of the space station. So, in one of those visible passes, um, just it, it, it's likely it could just be a little bit more than a thumb, maybe two thumbs, if you hold your thumb up. Oh, uh, right. Okay. Where the space station is. So it's pretty close. It's a lot dimmer, but nevertheless, look out for it. And it is space junk. It will eventually uh, burn up in the atmosphere. I've got a question, so, sir. Yeah. I've got a question. Mm. When stuff burns up into the atmosphere, does it cause, where does it, does it cause pollution on Earth? Yeah. 
so it, in, it, it definitely is a factor. Um, mostly, uh, so the things that they, they discard are um, through controlled uh, deorbit burns, and that's like uh, the progress resupply vehicle. They fill it up with trash after it's delivered all of its goods and food and stuff like that and experiments. Uh, and those ones that don't return to the Earth and land, they, they um, make it so that they burn up over the Pacific. A lot of times those things uh. have discarded stuff like, including um, the, the poop of astronauts. Just want to let you know, there is poop raining in, down. In those, yeah, that's right. So connect it together for me, Vicky. So you're on a you're on a boat in the Pacific. I'm on my Ocean, luxury cues. And I, with your, <laughs> yeah, you do and it. Tim Peake's poop comes down and gets <laughs> on my face. Well, no, not quite. It does burn up. But what do we all do when we see a shooting star? A meteor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're all wishing. So Scott um. Kelly. <laughs> yeah. So you're really, uh, you're really wishing on astronaut poo. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why. I'm going I now. don't know why. I don't know why I never knew that before. I, well, I mean, because lots of the kids say, "How do astronauts go to the toilet in space?" But the main question should be, "What happens next to it?" <laughs> That's right. Well, the students are very happy to discover that uh, it poo is not recycled. P is recycled, but poo isn't. What Thank color goodness flame? for that. What <laughs> colour flame would it burn with? <laughs> yeah, exactly. D depends what you were eating the night before, maybe. <laughs> we need to do so we could, need to find this out. <laughs> we need to do an experiment. Uh, cosmonaut poo versus NASA poo. Because <laughs> they do have different food, you know. <laughs> Oh dear! Has, have, yeah. have, we, have we gone off on a tangent? No, I think this needs to be a paper. This needs to be a paper. It does. Well, the the ISS currently has an open uh, solicitation period for does it projects. Yeah, it's, seriously, maybe it's uh, something you can get funding for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. I love oh, starting my you. Friday off uh, um, with a with a good laugh. I've been doing this <laughs> show for nearly a year and not had any toilet talk, so it was over, well overdue. Being as one, it's one of my favourite topics. What's up with you, England? I know we're so uptight. We're so uptight. <laughs> not now, at all, <laughs> Liam. You have got. Um, you have got. So we're getting loads of comments here on the software. When we finish, could you answer some of those questions on the? Um, on the Facebook, oh, yes. if that's possible, please. Yeah, sure. Probably I'll go to the Facebook, Facebook to reply. Um, I will do now, that. you've you've got a very illuminated astronomy background as well, haven't you? You're not just a space person; you are astro, aren't you? Uh, yes. In terms of, I used to be president of Orange County Astronomers, and for a time, I was a planetarium lecturer at the Griffith that's so Observatory. Good. So uh, it's a you know well-known observatory. You may have seen it on lots of TV film and things like that so uh so yeah that's uh, i i have a 10 inch lx 200 out in uh out in my garage here and uh, occasionally can hoik it out although my muscles aren't as strong as they used to be oh uh, well oh so yeah so i know i know exactly where to look for this nova tonight i'll get my binoculars out and check it out so i'll be i'll be on i know that we've run over a little bit here so it's fine uh, so yeah i'll answer those questions and um you know if anyone wants to get the download image for iss above uh, on my website um th th there's a link to it but uh, you can get it using the promo code uh yeah um pop astro oh very nice so there's a promo pop. code there's a promo code now don't buy the full unit from me um and and the promo code only works on my website it's for the download image so if you have a raspberry pi or you, or you want to build one um you can very uh, inexpensively get the download image uh i think it, it with that promo code it drops it to 10 bucks Woo! oh liam it's been image. so nice we've are had such a whirlwind <laughs> Oh, well, there's no heating in this. The walls are made of oh, glass. So, yeah, right. <laughs> Liam, it's been such a whirlwind romance because I think I only met you on Thursday or Wednesday, didn't I? Yes. And now I look. Know. It's superb. And and I would say I do love you. 
this is this is just such a wonderful thing that you've got going here and uh, um, and and say hi to your boyfriend and uh, oh let, let, okay let, thank let you my wife know that I just just declared my love for you on air Cosmo loves you too yeah. thank you Liam <laughs> right thank you and I'll be I'll be listening in so I'll, I'll hop over to the Facebook and start answering some questions so thank you great thank you Liam see you soon bye right. bye. Right, I've got a, a room full of uh, a Zoom party waiting for me at nine o'clock when I get home. So I'm going really quick tonight because these shows have been getting up to uh, an hour and a half long. So I want to leave at nine o'clock tonight, if that's OK, from the, the, the crazy stables where I am. So now we're going over straight to Eleni, racing through the Hello. night. I'm going to be as quick as I can. How's everybody <laughs> yeah. doing? We're really good. Carry on. Perfect. It's fine. Right. Before I Take start, your time. Take your time. Um, it's fine. <laughs> let me know if you can see my screen. Let's have a look. Uh, oh, there it is. Yeah. yeah. We're on. Oh, yeah. Wow. Lovely. Let me make that into a uh, slideshow. <laughs> I love jellyfish. I love jellyfish. I love them. That is I so cool. I love jellyfish too, but I have a little problem with this one because everyone sees the jellyfish. I see a Halloween distorted skull. So <laughs> I don't know. I was thinking of the jellyfish, but <laughs> to me, it looks very Halloween and very like a skull. So I don't know. Maybe my eyes are wrong. <laughs> no, I think it's a bit, a little bit of both. It's it's beautiful. What is it? I'll let you. It I'll let you carry on. Um, That's so good. This is actually a composite image of um, a space jellyfish. Well, not really an actual jellyfish. Um, is um, it's a very interesting observation. It actually um, is a, in the radio, so it's radio emission and it was very strange so it was a very peculiar kind of emission so observations lasted for about 12 hours and that area of sky was actually observed um, in five different radio frequencies and what's really strange about it it's that it's very very bright in like regular um, extragalactic radio emissions uh, but it, the signal completely disappears around 200 uh, megahertz, which is very strange. Like it's something that hasn't been seen before. So it is all new and exciting. Um, and it took quite a while to come up with a working theory as to why this is happening. And it's actually very interesting. So the idea behind it, the, the, the current working theory, as they call it, is that about two billion years ago, a few supermassive black holes from multiple galaxies emitted plasma jets about the same time. And these jets shone up for a while and then faded and kind of lay dormant. And then, um, like about now, or uh, very recently, um, Plasma started mixing together, so the plasma that made the jets, the, the, the very, very hot gas that made the jets, started mixing together. At the same time, uh, shock waves, very gentle shock waves, passed through it, and this shock wave interaction made the plasma shine up again, um, just in time for us um, to take a nice picture, which is so strange. It's like jellyfish is you know they are very peculiar to begin with like normal jellyfish <laughs> couple that with space jellyfish and the working theory is just really spooky in a very scientific way so i really liked that one and i really wanted to share it with you um so yeah this is uh the reignited plasma and this is a composite image. It's a, it's a combination of optical XMM data, which is X-ray data, um, and radio data. So it makes for this really beautiful um, jellyfish uh, structure. So moving on to something a bit more um, mundane, but still very interesting, if my laptop decides to move on. There we go. I don't know why I did that. OK. so. This one we all know about, right? We all know about Oumuamua. 
I love um, it. It's one brilliant. of the most exciting things ever, ever. I'm so totally glad to see agree. it again. Um, it's such an interesting thing, right? And I know it sparked oh, wow. a lot of sci-fi conversations. Um, but it's actually been, uh, its origin has finally been determined. And it might not be as exciting as uh, previous conversations might have suggested, aka, um, you know, uh, alien, extraterrestrial um, satellite technology and whatnot, um, which is a little bit, as far as I'm concerned, uh, of a hasty thing to say um, without enough observations because you make people super excited and then you give them the truth and they get like, ah, oh, Mm, astronomy is boring, which is not true at all. Um, <laughs> so this thing, this first object um, that was ever um, observed that is out, outside of our solar system. So it, it comes from the far beyond. Um, and it was very strange. It had very um, many strange features. So you couldn't quite classify it as a comet. Um, and one of the, th the main things that was lacking, it was um, um, the comet tail, which is a very um, a, a big characteristic of uh, comets, right? So the scientists that worked on it um, came up with a very interesting explanation, which actually makes a lot of sense. And it's quite likely uh, a fragment from a Pluto-like planet. So the calculations were quite complex, but bottom line was that um, if you used a solid nitrogen ice as um, one of the main components of uh, Oumuamua, um, this particular ice, uh, the calculations ended up matching exactly with observations. Um, and the interesting thing is that solid nitrogen ice is seen in Pluto, which led to the theory that this piece of, um, let's just call it planet fragment, um, was likely knocked off the surface of a Pluto-like planet from a from another star system, you know, far away. Um, and this impact was about half a billion years ago, and it knocked that particular fragment um, out of its parent system, and it made um, its way through our solar system in 2017. And that's it, it's just incredible. I don't know. I love that to think that's that, amazing. And, uh, um, where I live, where I live on Anglesey, it's famous for its ancient geology. And I know it's very hard right. to get into your head how long ago, half a billion years ago is, but the rocks here that I'm actually broadcasting from are about 500 to 600 million years old. That's half a billion, right? Oh, well, yeah. no, it's not, is it? About half, yeah. a, half a billion, yes. It yeah, that's be, half right? a billion, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A thousand million, I think. I think. So... <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do words, not numbers. <laughs> That's fine. I think I'm too tired to think right now um, of the correct I'm version. Sure Paul Sutherland, I'm sure Paul but Sutherland will correct us instantly. Let's just say about the, that the order of magnitude is fine. Is it, it should match what you're saying. So great. But let's st stick to the orders of magnitude. That's what I do with all my calculations. That's um. nice. <laughs> That's a great news report. Um, and I will finish off with my Aurora hey. alert. Ooh, so. Please. It's actually a really, uh, it, it should be spectacular, the one oh, that wow. far away on the 21st, because that, that particular uh, wind stream is actually uh, speedier than the ones we had so far. So this is at 600 kilometers per second. Uh, so just keep an eye out. Someone uh, took a beautiful picture, uh, Mr. Guy Perkland, which is a Norwegian name. I'm not sure I pronounced that right, but I tried. Um, <laughs> took this picture that I have here from last Saturday's um, Aurora. And this is from Norway. Um, and what's really interesting and exciting, I think, is that every single color or almost every color in this picture uh, comes from some form of oxygen, which is so interesting, right? Different, I guess, different molecular um, uh, versions of oxygen uh, give uh, all these different uh, colors, which is quite interesting. Um, yeah, so watch out. And if you get any beautiful pictures, 
uh, just send them to me and I will make sure I put them on the <laughs> space weather and news section. Oh, thank you so much. So, oh, that's lovely. So, um, I think we've got Sonia on shortly telling us about the equinox. So, it's um, usually the 21st is around the equinox. Yes. A day of perfect harmony and balance across the planet. So, imagine being able to see a Nova and Aurora on the equinox. What? I know, right? All these amazing things and the happening ISS. at the same time. And the Incredible. ISS as well. It's going to be a packed week. Yeah, hopefully we've got some clear skies coming and Equilux as well. Eleni, so. it's been a always, you light up my life so much. Oh, thank you very much. I and hope you all have you. a lovely evening that you're watching. And yeah. you have a great one and get home for nine to enjoy your Zoom party. Oh, it's going to be ace. They're already having it now. I can see all the messages going past on my Facebook and I'm like, mm, I'm stuck here doing amazing astronomy show. Well, show them. <laughs> You're doing the amazing astronomy. Oh, thank you. As it happens, my, my friend whose birthday is is obsessed with, irrationally obsessed with the colour purple. So I thought that I'd change the screen to purple and put purple glitter lipstick on in honour of her tonight. But she, she, do, she, do, she don't care about space. Uh, your lipstick is glorious. I wanted to say it looks like a galaxy. So like Ooh. those pictures of galaxies, yeah. it's beautiful. Let's just get rid of that. Thank you. It is good. The, the downside is I feel like I'm eating sand. <laughs> <laughs> LNE, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Have a purple kiss. <laughs> there we go. That was fun, wasn't it? Okay. Oh, right. OK, uh, the show is whizzing by. What a shame I've got to depart shortly. Um, OK. Um, oh, I've got something for you. We have been working on a little video and here it is. It's the new Pop Astro video. Are you ready for it? You know, when I first started being interested in astronomy, it was just a question of looking up at the night sky and it is spectacular even if you don't know what you're looking at but at some point very quickly you decide that you want to know more and the more you know the more wonderful it gets and uh, SPA has been helping people into astronomy to understand what they're looking at more than 50 years. As Brian says the SPA is a great way to start or accelerate your astronomical adventure. We spoke to our new president Professor Andrew Coates. Why should people join the SPA? Well, the SPA is really important to join. We have, I mean, it's probably the best society for entry-level astronomers in the UK. And the SPA um, gives you so many benefits. I mean, there's, of course, the, the magazine. It's great for young stargazers. My colleague Lucy um, is the um, chief stargazer. We have a packed section for the junior stargazer. I'm Lucy Green, I'm Chief Stargazer and it's my role to help you all enjoy the fun of astronomy. If you want to make new astro friends, our interactive chat show is the ideal place. Then, then you just float and it is, it's, like, um, it's like that feeling when you're just floating in a pool. There are so many reasons to join the SPA. What will yours be? strongly recommend if you want to learn a bit more you join the SPA or go to the website popastro.com How great was that? So that is running in conjunction with our uh, Sky at Night banner advert on the website and this is to encourage people to join the SPA so spread the word something horrible has just happened to me uh, while that was on I swear to God I heard a man's voice and it wasn't one coming from there. I swear it was coming from out, out there. I'm scared now. I'm just going to go and see if there's anybody. There can't be anybody coming. There can't be anybody who's coming. Oh, my gosh. These are very old buildings. I am freaking out slightly. There was a deep man's voice coming from outside of my headphones, and I don't know where the heck it came from. That was weird. So, okay. <laughs> We are now going to go over to Andy Lawrence. Hold my hand, Andy. Where's he gone? Oh. <laughs> Andy? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm worried now, though. You, did, you know, Just before me, you've got the Anglesey Ghost and Brian Cox. How am I <laughs> supposed to live up to that? 
You can't. You can't at all. I'm going to cuddle on to Cosmo. How are you, Andy? Well, I'm pretty well. I'm, um, I think I'm sort of excited and depressed at the same time, actually. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited because um, this is a very high energy show. I'm excited because I, I, I have written a book and I'm very proud of my book. You know, so plug it, plug, plug, plug. Okay. I'll get it in straight so, away. Yeah. So Don't yeah, even absolutely, ask. <laughs> absolutely. And in a minute, I'll, you know, I'll tell you about uh, why that is. But and I'm depressed because of the reason why I wrote the book, which uh... is the thought uh, over the next few years of thousands and thousands of satellites screwing up astronomical observations, professional ones and amateur ones, and what the hell we can do about it. And um, that's why, you know, a lot of astronomers around the world are getting kind of passionate about this at the moment. And um, so I wrote this book. It's, it's, uh, it's not for professional astronomers. It's a non-technical book. So, you know, it's meant for, you know, you can give it to your, your gran and uh, she should understand it. That's the idea to sort of bring it to more public attention. So I mean, she might, write you, she might write you out of the will if you give it to your gran, but... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, in the case of my grand, a bit too late for that, yeah, but... Um, oh. yeah, so. <laughs> anyway, how are you, are you enjoying tonight? It's been very exciting, hasn't it? Uh, my whole life is exciting, really. I'm just trying to get your slideshow on, my love, um, unless you've got it there. Well, uh, I have. Which is easier for us to do? Is it for depends for depends whether the software the the only downside with the software is screen share can sometimes be a bit erratic. So, should we see if you can do it? Yeah, so I've got it as you told me to do. I put it in a Google Doc. So if I yeah. do, I click the share button and share screen, and then I do that. Uh, and then you're looking at the whole of my web browser. I think. Is it? Are you seeing my web browser? Uh, yeah. I think you need to go to share Chrome tab. Oh wow, wow, wow. Okay, a minute. I'll, I'll stop screen share. Share screen. No, I don't see something that says share Chrome tab. Oh, you see, this is this is this is the thing, right? I think I might be able to do it. Um, right so, then. Oh, it's annoying though because I can't see the comments. Then let me have another look. Oh, right. Um, well, I'll whistle through them quite quickly anyway. Have story. you got? Have you got? Okay, all right. Uh, I'll I'll just do the ones. So, oh my word, let me have a think now. So I need to go to share share screen. Uh, Andy Lawrence and Sonia share, and then I think we get like a half baked. Oh, yeah, yeah. scroll back up. That? There. So that's that's near the that's near the that? that's not that's not that's about the fourth one. So, oh, they're in no particular there. order. There, there, I've not put all oh. of them on, so you're just gonna have to riff on the ones that have. Oh, about, all right. I think okay. So, this <laughs> this is this is actually from the beginning of the uh of, of the book in 2016. Um, I was part of a a movie being made about taking some students up the mountain and recreating some um, experiments and um, uh, and we went up Mount Gahara and Brian May came with us he'd wanted to go up there for for years he knew the filmmaker so uh, that's you can see Brian there with his with his arm up and me over on the on the right and uh, that's my daughter and my my uh, my son-in-law as well and uh, Blair was very excited because um uh, my son-in-law, because when Brian met him, he said, nice hat, you know, and I tell you that, that hat's hardly been taken off since, you know, so oh, wow. <laughs> that, was, that was a very exciting moment. All right, well, show me another picture and see what, see what comes up. Okay, out. in the random picture generator. There you go. Well, this is the light pollution we all know about. This, you know, the, the, from the, the night sky from City Lights and so on. This is Mount Wilson and the City Lights of Los Angeles. There's also forest fires in there, so there's a kind of double environmental catastrophe in this picture. So this has been a problem for astronomers for many years, getting worse and worse, of course. Um, but at least, you know, at least if you're a professional astronomer or you live somewhere dark like like Dumfries and Galloway, you can, uh, uh, you know, get away from it. Right? Um, but this new problem, the satellites, you can't get away from. Let's see what happens next. What have what, what you got for me next? Well, we just completely forgot to introduce you because I'm broadcasting from a haunted zone. So <laughs> Paul Sutherland is like, who is this Andy Lawrence geezer? Well, see, uh, uh, this Andy Lawrence geezer is Paul's old school friend, basically. And I was hoping I was going to show you some uh, some school photos of, uh, of of Paul. So if <laughs> That's the hey, well, there we go. This photo. is 1972. Uh, oh, Paul wow. sent me this photo. This is him just after school when uh, uh, he was uh, doing site testing in the Canaries. 
So there he is with an exciting Jeep and even more exciting flares. And that's what Those are look. incredible trousers, Mr. Sutherland. Can you still fit into them? Wow, look at them. <laughs> All right, so that's that's Paul. That's why I'm here. And so Paul be then became, became the sun spaceman and, uh, and, a, and a, 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 almost a sort of professional amateur astronomer, if you know what I mean. Um, and I became an actual professional professional astronomer. And so you know, our pipes diverged after that. Um, but... Um, Let's see. Can we? <laughs> this is a <laughs> this is a bit odd having the pictures in random order. But see what we got next. Uh, okay. Um, oh, where's the slideshow? Tada! Oh, oh wow. this, this is this. Right. This is my favourite. This is uh, this is the zodiacal light. So when we were on uh, Mount Guajara with uh, with Brian, um, we went up to look for the zodiacal light because it's really really dark on Mount Guajara. This is a picture taken by one of the students on that, that project, uh, Craig Brownhill. So you, you can see um, uh, it's, it's sloping across the sky. And um, that's how you could, so it follows the ecliptic. And that's how you can tell it's caused by dust scattering in, in, in the plane of the, the solar system. Whereas, you know, many people, when they're trying to see it, confuse it, for instance, with lunar twilight and various other things. This was the first time I'd seen it. I'd never seen the Zodiacal Light before. Uh, but no, it was when Brian started his PhD years and years ago, That this was his topic, Zodiacal Light. So he knew all about it. So there's a chance I might be able to see it this evening. I've been out twice looking for it. We've got quite a good horizon. How soon after dusk is it visible? Oh, uh, oh uh, no, you got me there. Um, and not very long after you, you see it. There's there's a there's an evening zodiacal light and a morning one as well. I think generally the evening one is easier to see, but it needs to get dark enough to uh, to see it. But on the other hand, the sun can't be too low because it's just you know just a little bit either side of the sun basically. It's so, a real rare, fleeting, beautiful thing to see, isn't it? Yeah, it was amazing. It was a real life experience for me. Um, so let's see what comes if it's related to the satellites and I'll go with it and if not we'll take it off and I'll just talk about it okay <laughs> see, what, see what we got next I, I think like you've got one more presentation I did truncate the pictures that you sent me so we've got one more which is the saddest of all ah okay so that here is at last this is um uh, the dark energy survey camera oh, uh, wow. picture taken at the end of 2019 so all those streaks are caused by um, satellites launched by uh, by Elon Musk and the uh, the Starlink project, and we're seeing more and more of these. They're appearing in amateurs' pictures. People see them visually uh, in the night sky, um, and it's just going to get worse and and worse. Um, so um, why don't you take the picture off now, and we'll, we'll go back to full scale because I'll just talk about it for a, a while, and then um, you can ask me questions. So I think I'll do with the, the sharing. Okay, there we are. The two, just the two of us. Yeah. So the thing is, it um, maybe we should have seen this coming, but I think for amateur and professional astronomers alike, it kind of felt like it came out of left field. So the thing is, you know, in uh, 2018, there were like 2,000 satellites in in the whole sky, uh, and but in 2020, there were 3,000, and nearly all of those have been added by Elon Musk. And now he's got approval for 12,000. He's planning to launch 42,000. Oh but other companies are getting into the act. People in China, Canada, um, Russia, all over the place, people are doing the same business. And um, there was a little a company in, in America called AGI who examined the, the filings to regulators to try and work out who'd made applications to launch fleets of satellites. And it looked like that by 2029, there was going to be 107,000 of them. Now, at that point, at the moment, those streaks, they're kind of annoying every so often, but they already are quite annoying and, you know, wasting public money, you know, with that, that picture of the dark energy survey camera had to be taken again. Hubble Space Telescope pictures are occasionally screwed up by them. Um, but, um, but in a few years when there's 100,000, um, you know, is it, look, here are my trusty binoculars, right? If you were to look up at the sky with a typical seven degree field of view and a pair of binoculars, um, then you would typically see about 10 in your field of view and they would take about 30 seconds to cross and they just keep coming. 
every wide field image by uh, uh, the Rubin Observatory is going to have a sort of a dozen of these streaks uh, going across it. It's even worse for the radio astronomers. Every in, they're, they're kind of blaring out radio waves as they pass over the horizon. Um, so, and it makes a lot of radio observations almost impossible. Um, it, and you know, I just worry it's the thin end of the wedge because it's just going to get worse. Pretty soon there's going to be advertising. You know, I'm, you know, who knows where it's going? So it really is very concerning. And you know, we thought the sky was ours, and and um, it, it's not. It's now been annexed by a billionaire, and there are lots more to come. So I'm hoping, you know, that we can do something about it by a mixture of protest and working on the regulators, um, because you don't. You'll have heard it's all about sort of internet connection and so on, and it is. But um, you don't need thousands and thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit to to join up the internet of the world. You can do it in higher orbits um, with many fewer satellites. Um, and I, th I think it's actually driven, the need to go very, very low is driven by having very short delay times, which the high speed traders, the finance people want. And they're the people putting the money into this. So it's depressing in various ways, right? But so I'm, so I'm being a bit of a sort of uh, dampener on this exciting This evening. is the only time I've ever sat through this show and pulled a sad face, but it's so potent what you're saying. And thank you for helping us raise awareness of it. I mean, is it something only like there's currently only three and a half thousand satellites in the sky? That's how many there are at the moment. It's also, of course, as you know, there's many, many more pieces of debris and, uh, and, yeah. and having thousands of satellites is going to, um uh, make the debris problem much worse as well i see someone's just asked anything improved with changes to starlink to reduce reflectivity um it, yes they did they paint some of their satellites black and it helps a bit but you know by the time some random chinese or brazilian company launches their fleet you know they, they won't do it and, so and they go over like spelling that. out a word or something <laughs> <laughs> yeah who, who knows who knows but just on the debris thing, the other big news, Jude, I don't know if you picked this up. There's a very exciting space mission being launched tomorrow called Astro Scale. Oh, uh, yes, amazing. Yeah, to, yeah, they're going to yeah, try yeah. to harness some space junk. It's right, that on the, so that's good because we can end on an optimistic note because somebody is trying to do something about it. I don't know if they have a real business case, if that will survive, you know, but um, it is, it's quite exciting. And um, I think we must all watch out for news of that tomorrow. Um, thank you so much. So, just plug your book again for us, love. Yeah, there's a, there was this is called Losing the Sky. Um, Great. It's got, it's got a forward by Brian. Um, and um, yeah, so you can, at the moment, it's, it's all online. You can uh, uh, buy it from Amazon or Apple Books or Google Play. Uh, no, it's not in high street shops, but the high street shops aren't open at the moment anyway. Ha. Know, so. I'll show them. <laughs> So not available in all good box shops then. No, no, all good on, on online retailers. You know that's the uh, the plan at the moment. Andy, thank you so much. Just give us a little bit of a talk, chat about what your day job is, please. Uh, well, mostly teaching and admin. That's the truth, of course. Uh, but well, otherwise, what I should be doing, um, partly it's quasars, and I love black holes and things when they go bang and trying to figure out why they go bang and what the hell's going on. So that, that's my research. But also, and the reason I, I got got worried about got into this, I do a lot of survey astronomy. That's why, no, I'm involved in the Rubin Observatory, mapping the sky with big detectors. And I've, I've done that for, for years, and that's really going to get screwed up by uh, by this stuff. So, yeah, I like quasars that go bang and mapping the sky. That's my, that's my thing. Mm, thank you so much. Oh, Andy, well... Uh, uh, you should have been on. I got my Andy's muddled up and put the wrong Andy on a few weeks ago. So thank you for sitting tight. That's my pleasure, and I'm sure I'm sure Andrew Coates was pretty good actually. So there you go. Yeah, um, I think. I, well, he's our president, and you are our king. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. It's, I'll do a, a curtsy for you. It's been a pleasure, Andy. And come on, anytime you would like to make us feel sad again, please. Yeah, well, I'll come on another time and tell you something exciting rather than something depressing. I'll tell you about... I know, some... quickly then. Tell us what's the best thing you've ever seen in the sky. The zodiacal light. Oh, <laughs> it, I, okay, it, yeah. It really shook me. Right, at a professional level, I, you know, um, 
I, I think it's a, a tidal disruption event that was, uh, with a bunch of other people that we saw in 2015. As a star going close to a black hole, getting ripped apart, and it makes the whole thing sort of flare up by a factor of 100 and then die away again. So seeing a black hole eating a star, uh, that was pretty amazing, I would say. Oh, God, Paul's just mentioned that we were... You played Two Little Princes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what was the play? Um, uh, what was the play? That um, Was that the government inspector? No, that wasn't it. Was What was that it? sounds Paul? like a heavy-duty play for little kids. I, I, well, we did, <laughs> we did, well, we were quite big kids by then, but I think, you know, don't know about me, but Paul was quite cute compared to now. <laughs> what happened? Too much time <laughs> squinting down an eyepiece. Yeah. <laughs> Gegenschein. What's Gegenschein? I don't even know what Gegenschein is. Uh, Paul can explain in, in the Facebook chat. <laughs> okay. There, we'll a, go out on 180 that. degrees away from the zodiacal light, basically. Backscattering. I, ooh. Okay. I did not know this one. A Man for All Seasons. Yeah. Uh, a Man for All the Seasons, apparently, was the play. Oh, Man for All Seasons. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. What lovely images and thoughts. Thank you so much, Andy. Speak to you soon. Bye. 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 Oh, this is great. This is great. Okay. We're going to go over to Sonia now. Sonia is our new weather presenter and she has got information on something which you may or may not know about. It's one of my favorite words ever the equilux. Sonia. <laughs> Hello. Are you all right there? No. Yes, I've got. I've, we've decided on a name for him, and I really liked Meteor. So he's. Um, I thought it's great. Meteor, Meteor the Monkey. Pleased to I meet really you. I really liked on. that. Oh, there Meteor we go. Monkey. How are you this evening, Sonia? I'm good. I'm going to try and try and get through this as quickly as possible. So we've got the equinox, we've got the equinox, and we've got the weather forecast <laughs> all going on. Now. I'll how much there is just, How I'll much there is going on in the sky? Go on, off you go. The ISS and the equinox and the aurora. I'm like, oh no, everyone's like riding on my weather forecast tonight, aren't they? So we'll start with the equinox. I don't know if you've got the PowerPoint presentation I sent over to you. Let me have a look. See, my screen share has gone a bit dicky, actually, as per usual. Stop screen. Right, then I'm going to try. Hang on a minute. Right, share. Share screen. Chrome tab. Uh, Sonia's Equilux PowerPoint. Uh, is that on? Oh, there we go. Let me see what happens if I press view. Oh, I'm gone. Got it. View. It's never glamorous the way I do this. How's that? That's fine. That'll do. Yeah, <laughs> I did it. So we just had the um, Equilux yesterday, which as you can see, it is uh, means equal day and equal night. So we get equal light. Um, so it occurs just before the spring equinox, which happens at precisely 37 minutes past nine tomorrow morning. And it happens just before the autumn equinox. So the equinox happens yesterday because of how the sun appears on the it is how the disc appears of the sun in the sky on this particular day. So as the sun just hits the horizon, so the top end, the top part of the sun comes up before the central part of the sun. So as soon as we see that tip of the sun, that's when that start of the 12 hours start to rise. So when we just see it go down at sunset, that's how we get that 12 hours. And not forgetting of how all the sun is refracted by the atmosphere. But we, so we don't get equal day in that. We actually get 12 hours and 10 minutes of it, but it's supposed to be equal equal light. But it does depend on the latitude of where you are because it's not exactly the same everywhere else. So if you are in New York, for example, it doesn't happen until the, 27th, the 25th of September at 6.47 a.m. to 6.47 p.m. Compared to the equinox that happens um, tomorrow morning at 37 minutes past nine, it's for the northern for the hemisphere is exactly the same. But the equinox compared to equinox doesn't have anything to do with the equator compared to the equinox. So the equinox happens when the sun crosses the path of the equator and it's directly above the equator of how we get the equinox. So equi means equal and nox means that, but it's not exactly is that the same? And that's the difference between equilux and equinox. So the equilux is when the, the sun is appears different in the sky 
and how it rises and it sets of how we get those 12 hours. And then the equinox has all to do with the equator. There are a lot of um, complicated explanations of how the equinox happens in terms of the um, ecliptical way of how it goes around the sun and the certain equinautical points of how we get the spring equinox, the summer solstice of the longest day, the autumn equinox, so then it goes the southern part of the hemisphere and then we get the winter solstice however i will go through that next week of how the seasons happen okay did everyone get that yeah thanks for giving <laughs> i tried to explain that. that as simple as possible that was <laughs> so amazing equilux, thank you so the equilux is from the sun's sunrise to sunset on that particular day when we get 12 hours and the equinox is the when it goes crosses the equator's path and it goes directly above the equator and that's when we start to go into the enormous hemisphere which is going to happen tomorrow morning when we cross the path of the equator and don't oh, forget yes. next yeah and next week don't forget i will remind everyone we put the clocks forward as well i am so so happy about that the lighter evenings are coming but it means i'm gonna have to stay up later now for my astronomy as well Oh, thank you. Liam's saying oh. great explanation. People are saying that they didn't <laughs> know that. Um, so, yeah, I think Equilux is a blimmin' good uh, little bit of uh, space trivia there. So thank you. A great explanation, Sonia. So quick on to the weather. I really do want to hide in a cupboard because it's not looking very good at all. Tomorrow oh, no. night, just forget tomorrow, it's just going to be cloud and nothing but cloud. Tonight, as you can see, High Wycombe spent the southeast going down to the Bournemouth with light and just like a little bit of Cornwall, but not quite Cornwall. It is going to be clear tonight, so they've got the best. Looking at the surface pressure charts, we still have the high pressure over us, so it is going to still give us those dry conditions. The jet stream now it is still over us. I did say last week for last Friday it was going to move Tuesday, Wednesday, but it was making me look like I was telling fibs because it's just not moved at all. It does look like I don't want to say it. It does look like though tomorrow not tomorrow, Sunday, it is going to be above the UK. So it's sort of like it has moved north, but it's more west than what it should have. So it's moved north, but then it's gone down the UK oh, instead of going no, over the UK. And that's what's happened with it. But it does look like on Sunday it will go above the UK. Um, going forward into the week, next week, it's going to be partly cloudy. It is going to be hit and miss, I'm afraid, with the cloud. I am trying to do the day before forecast to make them a lot more precise at the moment so tomorrow night at the moment it's not looking very good for everybody it's just looking cloudy more cloud and you've guessed it more cloud oh sonia i know you go to great lengths to do these weather <laughs> forecasts and you don't just read them off the bbc you actually compile these properly yourself i actually you? do so i, I like i have the service better of the service pressure charts so i'm looking at now for if I go to do, 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 if I go to um, so Saturday, we've got a nice ridge of high pressure over us. Sunday, a bit of a low pressure coming from like a low pressure with the with the temperatures, but we still got that high pressure giving us more stable conditions. Then I've got the jet stream forecast. So at the moment, if I go back, do, 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 if I go back to 12 o'clock this afternoon. It's sort of like above Scotland, but it's like coming like across from like probably northeast across the cent central southern UK. And then if I go then towards, uh, let's have a look. So uh, nine o'clock tomorrow morning, it does look like it's slightly gone. Look, going to, it's just like tipping a Scotland jet stream and sort of like just scratching the surface of the southeast. But then by the time we get to Sunday, it's nicely above the UK then, which Sunday oh. does look the best part of the week at the moment for clear conditions. So I will bring a full forecast for everybody, probably Sunday oh. morning to be more precise for everybody. The forecast. Oh, Sonia, you are our legend. Thank you so much for all your efforts. <laughs> One of the You're welcome. UK members. Uh, okay, thank you. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Oh, lovely, lovely. Right, okay, we're going to go now. That was just so weird when we were running that advert before, and I swear it was like a, a big, deep, masculine voice, unless it's something that's on the soundtrack of the video that I've not heard.
But there we go. That's what happens when you stay in deserted holiday stables. Right, I'm going to go now. I don't really want to, but I've got a gaggle of gals. Thank you, Sonia. I know. Isn't she lovely? Waiting for me on Facebook Messenger. Hence, I've got the disco lipstick on. Um, doesn't really go with a with a dirty old duffel coat. <laughs> I'm going to pack up, shoot off home. Thank you, everybody, so much for contributing. Like, tag, share the video. Please share the video. It really helps us out. And do encourage your astronomical societies to join Pop Astro for £23 per year. Have a lovely party. I'm going to go and have a party. <laughs> Great show, Vicky. Thanks to you and all your guests. Love it. It's great, isn't it? It does get in your chops. And probably about halfway through the night, it all just comes off like a jellyfish. It all just goes, the glue gives out and it comes off. Uh, I do look glam tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I do feel glam. Got new eyebrow makeup. Thanks, everybody and everyone. I love you all so much. Thank you, Liam. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Robin. What about Robin? Robin? Hi there. Robin. Oh, yeah. I forgot that you were there waiting for us. Yeah, we've got a stronger live view of the net of the Nova. And I've changed um, the lens. So can you can you do the your usual wizardry with that, and we'll just pick out where it is? Yeah, let's go full screen. Did you see the zodiacal light tonight, Robin? No, oh, the no moon's chance. Too bright. The moon's yeah. too bright. Right, I'll just I'll just show you where it is now. You can see a brightish star more or less in the middle of the field of view there, right? Yeah. And if you go below that, you can see a cluster of stars, which is actually the the cluster M52 in Cassiopeia. Now keep going, oh. and right down at the bottom of the the field of view, there is a pair of stars. I haven't got my laser pointer wait, working, it's dying on me. And the oh. upper one of that pair of stars, right at the bottom of the field of view, is the Nova. I'm going to shift things up a bit so it's going to be more central. There we go. So, star in the middle, go down, you see the cluster M52, keep going, and you can see a pair of stars, and there's nothing else below those. And the brighter one of those two is the Nova, Nova Cassiopeia. Nine, uh, 2021. So I couldn't see it very well with binoculars, but there you go. That's what it looks like. Yeah, Robin, well done. An excellent little bit of a, um, astronomy there for us. Well done for hooking it all up. And thank you so much. And we've been seeing Starlinks go past as well. We didn't see one just now. They've been going through every minute or so. Oh. Well, that's not very nice, is it? Okay. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going to All end right. the broadcast now. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you.